Slenderman is one of the scariest urban legends to have come out of the internet. He is a tall, faceless figure wearing a black suit with long tentacle-like arms. And the legend goes that Slenderman stalks, abducts, and kills children. However, if these children can give him a sacrifice in the form of another child, then they will be spared for appeasing Slenderman. Of course, we know that none of this story is true. Slenderman does not exist. These rules do not actually exist. But today we're gonna be talking about two people that believed in this urban legend wholeheartedly to the point where they actually acted on it. So today's video is going to be another solved true crime case. Today we're going to be talking about the infamous Slenderman stabbing. But quickly, before we get into the case, I do just want to thank our sponsor for making this video possible, NordVPN. If you go to nordvpn.com forward slash Eleanor, the link is also down below in the description if you just want to click it. There you will find an exclusive deal waiting for you and it is completely risk-free with NordVPN's 30-day money-back guarantee. You guys already know how much of a big fan I I am of NordVPN. I have been using a VPN for years and years and years now, mainly just to get more out of the internet. With a VPN, you unlock so much more content, so many different websites, content that is restricted or blocked in your country. Basically, all you have to do is open the NordVPN app and with one click, pick a country and they'll make it appear as though you're using the internet as though you're there instead of where you are. And this comes with so, so many benefits. The main one for me has always been internet safety. This helps to hide your IP address, makes it seem as though you're operating from a different one so that your IP address is not like trackable and hackable. Of course, internet safety is the most important thing here, but I would be lying if I didn't say my main use of NordVPN is to get better streaming service selections. Because obviously all the different countries have different streaming service catalogs. Like Netflix in the UK is completely different to Netflix in the USA. So I'm always VPNing over there because they've, <laughs> they've got a better selection. I think we've got the better Disney Plus selection over here in the UK. Last time I checked, we did, but America's always had better Netflix and I've always used a VPN to get over there. And last time I talked about NordVPN, I told you about their new threat protection feature, which I'm still obsessed with. This makes, it takes NordVPN up a level completely, makes it a whole cybersecurity tool. Basically it blocks intrusive ads, it checks all the things that you download for potential malware. It's just got so many like protective features in it. Have a look, it's amazing. I don't wanna live without it now. There's so, so many reasons to love NordVPN. And like I said, if you go to nordvpn.com forward slash Eleanor, the link is also down below in the description. There'll be an exclusive deal waiting there for you and it is completely risk-free with NordVPN's 30 day money back guarantee. Thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Now, before we get into it, I do just wanna give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this video. This video is for educational purposes and everything that I'm about to say is just information that I have found on the internet and I'm compiling into one video. I just have one trigger warning before we get into this case. I hope I'm not missing any, but today we are going to be discussing schizophrenia as part of this case. So if that is something that you don't want to hear about right now, I completely understand. Click out this video. Hopefully I'll get to see you again some other time with a different case. But with all that being said, Let's get straight into the case. Peyton Lutner was 12 years old at the time of this case. She was originally born on February 13th, 2002 in Wisconsin. She lived with her parents, Stacy and Joe Lutner, and as far as my research goes, she had a perfectly normal, happy childhood. She was a happy, healthy kid. Nothing too much to know. Peyton had a very typical life of a young girl her age. She went to school, she played out with friends. She had two um, like close friends. They were like a little trio when they were 12 years old. It was her, a girl named Morgan and a girl named Anissa. But they hadn't always been a three. This was more of a recent thing over the last like two years. Before that, it had always been Peyton and Morgan. They were like a best friend duo. Her full name was Morgan Geyser and she had had 
quite a troubled upbringing. I mean, her mother had tried to make it as normal and happy as she possibly could, but Morgan's father suffered from quite severe schizophrenia. He was hospitalized a lot through Morgan's childhood and it really put a strain on their family life. It meant that Morgan's mother was busy a lot of the time. And like I said, she tried to give her daughter the best childhood that she possibly could. But a lot of the time, Morgan just had to entertain herself. And this was when she started going on the internet. She was only about nine or 10 years old at this point, but she would go on the internet and she would look up like scary things, like scary stories, scary pictures. Like she was reading all these creepy paranormal things about ghosts and different creatures. And she would go into school and she would tell these stories to all her nine, 10 year old friends and they would be so freaked out. Of course, like these are the kind of stories that give kids nightmares. I know they gave me nightmares when kids would come into school and tell these horrid stories. And so actually over time, as Morgan kept doing this, she kept telling these awful, horrible, scary stories these kids didn't want to spend time with her anymore. They were like traumatized by all these things that she would tell them. So they started distancing themselves from Morgan Geyser and she found herself not really having any friends. And this is actually how Morgan and Peyton met because Peyton was such a sweet, empathetic girl. And one day she saw Morgan standing alone at break time because she didn't have any friends left really. And Peyton just felt so sorry for her. She thought that everyone deserved to have a friend. Everyone deserved to have someone to talk to. And so Peyton went over to Morgan, introduced herself and the two of them really got on. And honestly, from that point on, the two of them were besties. They were best friends and they were very, um, they were very different from each other, but kind of in complementary ways. So Morgan was a bit more of a wild child where Peyton Peyton was a bit more goody goody. And so they like kept each other in balance. Morgan helped Peyton to step out of her comfort zone, but Peyton made sure that they weren't getting in trouble, you know? The two of them were absolutely inseparable for the next few years. They would spend as much time together as they possibly could. They would have sleepovers at each other's houses. They would be up into the early hours of the morning, just giggling, laughing, joking together. And Morgan was still into all of her like creepy, scary stories. And she did share them with Peyton quite a few times. But she'd kind of learned her lesson at this point. She didn't go like full force with the stories on Peyton. This time she just kind of showed her a lot of the pictures that she drew because actually Morgan was quite a talented artist. And so she would draw all these like creepy creatures and they were good drawings to be fair. But they were so, so creepy. And she would like write words around the creepy drawings. Like I want to kill and stuff like that. Quite a red flag actually. But anyway, she would show them to Peyton and Peyton would be like, oh, oh. Cool, yeah, cool. Peyton tried not to judge Morgan for her interest. Cause I mean, some people just are into like horror and scary, creepy stuff that other people aren't into. Peyton didn't judge her, but that didn't mean that she was into it. Cause oh no, she wasn't. She hated all this scary, creepy stuff. She was very easily scared was Peyton. And she would be terrified of some of the stories that Morgan would tell her. So much so that she'd be like laid up at night in bed, unable to sleep, just thinking about all these different things that Morgan had fed her. But she stayed friends with Morgan and she wasn't really brave enough to tell Morgan to like stop telling her the stories. Cause I don't think she wanted to admit that she was scared of it really. Cause when you're a kid like, and other people don't seem scared by something, you don't want to be the one to be like, guys, I'm actually scared. Can we stop talking about this? So yeah, for that reason, she just kind of put up with the, with the scary stories for a while. So anyway, eventually a third girl was added to their duo, Anissa Weir. She was the exact same age as the other two girls and she, she fit in this group really, really well. But when friendship groups become trios, this is where problems arise and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about if you've ever been in a trio friend group. All of my friend groups when I was young, young were trios and there's always one person left out. There's always a third wheel and then two people that are closer and it sparks like jealousy and fallouts and stuff all the time. Whether it happens consciously or subconsciously, more often than not with trio friend groups, the two people that are closer end up leaving the third person out. Like I say, sometimes it's not on purpose but sometimes it does just happen. And the third wheel of this friendship trio was Anissa because she was the newest addition to the group and Morgan and Peyton had been friends literally since, I, I think they were like four years old when they first met and then they became proper friends later on in school. I mean, they'd had other friends as they grew up and then they made friends that day when Morgan was all alone. And since then they'd been inseparable. So of course, when a third person joins, they're not gonna just 
lose what they had there. You know, this really strong connection that they've built up for years. And I think Anissa was a little bit jealous of this. She was quite jealous of Peyton in particular because Anissa was a lot more like Morgan than she was like Peyton. So Anissa got on better with Morgan, but of course Morgan's already got a best friend. She don't want Anissa as her best friend because Peyton's her best friend. So this, I think there was some jealousy within this group. But Anissa and Morgan did end up growing closer and closer as time went on because they actually lived in the same apartment building. So they would get the bus to and from school together every day without Peyton. So they would end up having loads of different conversations where they would bond just the two of them. And they found out that both of them really liked all these creepy internet horror stories. So together, Morgan and Anissa start digging further and further into all these like internet urban legends. And this is when they came across Slenderman. Slenderman is a tall, thin, faceless humanoid creature. He is pale white with long, thin, gangly arms. He always wears a black suit. And if that's not creepy enough, he also has these long tentacle things that come out of his back and like, you know, and he can grab things with him. And Slenderman's whole thing, his whole bit, is that he stalks, abducts, and kills children. And so he will often hang about in places like parks and playgrounds. And there's also a specific woods that he is known to actually live in. So yeah, he stalks, abducts, and kills. But if he's not doing one of those three things, he can also give his victims what is called slender sickness. And this is what happens when you get in a close proximity to Slender Man, but he doesn't like capture you you're still effed. Like, you're still probably gonna die. When you get this slender sickness, the symptoms are severe paranoia, uh, nightmares, nosebleeds. The sickness slowly, slowly drives you insane until you become one of his little minions and turn murderous yourself. So getting slender sickness turns you into a killer. Now let me make this very, very, very clear. I'm sure a lot of you already know this, but Slender Man is not real. He is not real. Uh, of course, this is a made up creature. Slenderman as a character was originally created in 2009 on a forum called Something Awful. Someone posted about like a Photoshop competition where they wanted people to Photoshop paranormal, supernatural, creepy images and they were all gonna vote for the best ones. And loads of people were just creating like, you know, pictures that look like there's a ghost in the background or like, oh, there's eyes in the mirror and stuff like that. But the guy that created Slenderman went above and beyond with his competition entry. His name was Eric Knudsen, his username was Victor Surge and he posted two pictures for his entry. And actually both of these pictures had a caption alongside them that gave a bit more story, a bit more context, something that none of the other entrants had done. So this gave like a law to these photos and to this creature that Eric had created. The first picture is of a group of teenagers and behind them you can see Slenderman with his arms outstretched and the caption for this one read, we didn't want to go, we didn't want to kill them, but it's persistent silence and outstretched arms horrified and comforted us at the same time. 1983, photographer unknown, presumed dead. The second picture was a group of much, much younger kids at the park and this caption read, one of two recovered photographs from the Stirling City Library blaze. Notable for being taken the day which 14 children vanished and for what is referred to as the Slender Man. Deformities cited as film defects by officials. Fire at the library occurred one week later. Actual photograph confiscated as evidence. 1986, photographer Mary Thomas missing since June 13th, 1986. So that was the first ever creation of Slender Man. It was done by Eric Knudsen on Photoshop. It's not real, it's loads of pixels. And so he posted this competition entry and soon it found its way to different websites, mainly Creepypasta, which is where all these kind of scary urban legend stories circulate and it very quickly blew up on there. In this day and age, probably everyone with an internet connection has heard of Slenderman. It's been about for years, people still reference it to this day. He's a really just well-known character. People dress up as him for Halloween. There's been like games made about it and stuff. There's plushies, there's t-shirts, there's like follow-on stories that have been made, fan fictions, like everything that you could expect has been made. I think I even saw him referred to as a pop culture icon at one point during my research, which I don't know, that kind of made me giggle. Pop culture icon, Slender Man. So you can see how widespread this, this fictional supernatural character became. Everyone knew about it. And of course, Morgan and Anissa stumbled across it on the internet 
And immediately they were so into this story. Morgan more so than Anissa, but they were both so interested in this. At the girls' next sleepover, when it was all three of them, Anissa and Morgan told Peyton the story of Slenderman. And this absolutely scared poor Peyton out of her skin. She she was so scared by the idea of Slenderman, so much so that she went home and panicked to her mother. And her mother had to reassure her, like, don't worry, it's made up. That Slenderman does not exist. He's not gonna come and get you, you you're safe. Because the way her friends had told her this story was so, so convincing. It was like they genuinely believed it was real. So much so that, of course, Peyton believed them. Peyton was so, so scared of Slenderman. And the girls just kept on talking about him every time that they were together, nearly, because they were obsessed with it at this point. They just found this new story. They were obsessed with figuring everything out, learning everything there is to know. And Peyton was kind of at her wick's end with it. She was getting nightmares. She couldn't sleep at night because honestly, the conversation within this friend group just constantly revolved around horrifying, scary, supernatural stuff that she didn't want to hear about. And she did actually debate kind of distancing herself from these girls and maybe making new friends, but she really didn't want to do that because at the end of the day, she loved these girls, especially Morgan Geyser. The two of them had been friends since they were tiny, tiny, tiny. She didn't want to give up a friendship like that just because her friend has like kind of a weird interest. So yeah, she just kind of put up with it. And the more she listened to Morgan talking about Slenderman, the more she realized that Morgan really believed this. Like she didn't realize that it was a an urban legend. Like she thought this guy existed. He was stalking, murdering and abducting children. And it was really an obsession, like I've said. Like it's all the girls ever talked about and they really truly believed it. They were so deluded. As time went by, the dynamic of this friendship trio started to shift, as I'm sure you can imagine, when Morgan and Anissa have this shared, super, super strong interest and they live in the same apartment building, get the same bus to and from school, they gradually became closer and Peyton grew more distant from both of them. So now they were the new two and Peyton was the third wheel. Oh, one thing I forgot to say when I was talking about Slenderman is that these two girls' parents knew that they were like obsessed with Slenderman. They they didn't keep it a secret, but their parents didn't really think there was anything wrong with that. I mean, they just kind of thought it was like being into horror movies or something, which so many people are. That's a huge, huge genre. If we judged every single person that was into horror as a genre, we'd be suspicious of everyone at all times. And at the end of the day, kids are kids. And a lot of them do get into stuff like this because it feels rebellious to be searching up these like creepy, scary things. It's stuff that you've not been allowed to access for years because everything's age restricted. And now you finally get access to the internet and access to this whole genre that you've never explored. And a lot of kids do get into horror in their teen years. So their parents really didn't think it was an issue. So as things stand in 2014, all three girls are still friends, but there has been a shift in the dynamic of the group. Now Morgan and Anissa are closer and Peyton is kind of on the outside a little bit. On May 30th, 2014, Morgan Geyser was celebrating her 12th birthday with a sleepover with her two best friends in the whole entire world, Anissa Weir and Peyton Lutner. It was gonna be just the three of them. Earlier that day, they'd gone out to an ice skating rink. They went and got ice cream. They'd been having a great day. And then they were gonna come home and finish the evening with a movie and a sleepover. And they had had so many sleepovers in their time. It was almost like a routine, like a formula. They would get in, they would watch a movie, they would have snacks, they would stay up into the early hours of the morning, joking, laughing, talking. But tonight didn't exactly go that way. Pretty much as soon as they got back to Morgan's apartment, she was like, okay, let's let's go to bed now, let's all go to sleep. And it was a bit weird because she had never done that before, never ever. They loved staying up late because sleepovers were the only time that they were allowed to do it. Peyton just kind of assumed that Morgan was tired after the day that they'd had. It had been a big day. They'd been ice skating and everything. And so the girls did it. They just all went into Morgan's bedroom and went to sleep. The next morning, Peyton woke up and Anissa and Morgan weren't there anymore. She was alone in that bedroom. So she got up and out of bed and she starts walking around the apartment trying to find them. And she finds the two of them sat at Morgan's computer. They said to her that they woke up pretty early and they didn't want to disturb her. They wanted to just let her sleep. So they just like snuck out of the room and came and played on the computer for a while. So anyway, now that all three girls are awake, they all had breakfast together. They had donuts for breakfast because 
If you can't have donuts for breakfast on your birthday, when can you? And as they were eating, they were discussing what they were going to do today. And Morgan suggested that they go for a walk in the park. It was really nice weather and they could play around for a while. And yeah, all the girls were up for it. So Morgan's mother drove all three of them to a park called Dave's Park. David's Park. Why did I nickname it David's Park? <laughs> Dave's Park. So yeah, on the morning of May 31st, all three girls arrive at David's Park and they walk off into the woods for a little bit. And then Morgan suggests that they play hide and seek. Morgan volunteered to count while Anissa and Peyton ran off and hid somewhere. So she turned around, covered her eyes, started counting and the two girls ran into the woods. As they got far enough away from Morgan, Anissa turned to Peyton and said she had an idea. She had an idea for a really good hiding spot. She told Peyton to lay down on all the leaves and she would cover her with all the all the leaves and sticks and stuff so Morgan wouldn't be able to see her. She would just walk straight past. So they did. Peyton lays down, Anissa covers her in all these leaves so she can't see anything now. She can just hear and she hears Anissa run off presumably to go and find her hiding spot. So now Peyton is laying there covered in leaves. She can't see anything. She's just laid there in silence and she hears Morgan stop counting. And then she hears footsteps all around her, snapping on twigs and everything. And the next thing Peyton knows, someone has jumped on top of her and is holding her down, like pinning her down. Obviously all the leaves were still on top of her at this point, so she can only vaguely see different bits. But she could make out what was going on. In a blur, she saw that the person pinning her down was Anissa Weir. She had her down by the arms. So now she's restricted by Anissa. She's trying to like get up and out of the corner of her eye, she sees Morgan grab her backpack and pull a knife out and then turn to face Peyton on the ground. Morgan then ran over to Peyton and also jumped on top of her. So now both of them are weighing her down. And right before she did anything, Morgan Geyser leaned down to Peyton and whispered in her ear, I'm so sorry. She then proceeded to stab her best friend 19 times as Anissa held her down. She was stabbing her all over her body, not just her chest and her torso, but her arms, her legs, everywhere that she could stab her. And when she was finally done with the attack, Morgan eased off. Her and Anissa just looked down at Peyton who was covered in stab wounds, covered in blood. And I think they panicked a little bit. They were saying to her, we're gonna go get you some help. We'll, we'll run off, we'll find some help. We'll come back for you. It's okay, you're gonna be okay and the two of them ran away. But Peyton's not stupid. She knew that they were not gonna come back for her. They were not gonna get her help. And she knew that the only way that she could possibly survive this attack was if she tried to go and get help herself. And so with 19 stab wounds all over her body, this 12 year old girl manages to somehow pick herself up and stagger all the way through the thick of this woods. She's having to hold onto trees just to keep herself up. She can't see anything. She's in immense pain. She is bleeding at an alarming rate. I don't, I can't even imagine what is going through her head at this point in time. She's probably just focused on trying to survive. Eventually she staggered out of the woods and onto a path in this park and it was there where Peyton's body just gave in and she collapsed to the ground. She was still breathing, she was still alert, she could still talk, but she just didn't have energy in her body or strength to be able to pick herself up and hold herself up. But by some sort of miracle, almost at this exact moment, a cyclist comes biking down that path and sees Peyton collapsed on the ground. She manages to shout out to him and tell him the situation that she'd been stabbed, she needs help, and this man was able to call her an ambulance. So the ambulance arrived at the scene and rushed 12 year old Peyton Lutner to hospital where her wounds were examined. And despite being stabbed 19 times, only two of these stab wounds were actually severe. The other 17 were only like skin or muscle deep. They hadn't been done that deep. And that is probably the reason that she survived this. But these two major wounds that she had required emergency surgery and one of them genuinely very, very nearly killed her. It was a stab wound in her chest, a really deep one that had grazed her aorta, which is one of the main arteries that takes blood away from your heart. So had that been pierced, luckily it was just grazed. Had it been pierced, Peyton probably would have bled out within a matter of minutes. In fact, the doctors found that if that stab wound had been just one millimeter deeper, which is like less than a hair width, then she probably would have died. And the second major wound was also horrific. It was one big stab wound through her liver, stomach, and her diaphragm. This caused massive internal bleeding. Again, she needed emergency surgery on that. And luckily, 
Peter Lutner survived this attack. She survived these injuries. They managed to stitch her up and take her to a hospital room to recover. But the recovery was about to be very, very long and very difficult. Peyton, for the first few days that she was recovering in hospital, she had tubes all over her for different things to help her breathe, to help her eat. She couldn't talk because she had so many tubes in her mouth. She had to communicate through whiteboard, like write things down if she wanted to talk to her mom. After a few days, all these tubes and stuff were removed and Peyton was able to recover a bit more comfortably, and after seven days in hospital, she was discharged back home. So of course, there is absolutely no mystery in this case whatsoever. We know exactly who did this to Peyton. It was her two best friends. Peyton could say that. Peyton survived the ordeal. She lived to tell the story. But actually, police already knew. They already knew, even when Peyton was in her emergency surgery, she hadn't told anyone anything yet but police had already caught Morgan Geyser and Anissa Weir. It was literally within hours of the attack because these two girls really made like no attempt to cover up what they'd done. I don't think they even really had a plan. I think they just left the woods and just ran, like tra just tried to get away. There's some theories that these girls were actually trying to get to the specific woods where Slenderman lives. Although I don't know where that is and I don't know. I only read that on like one or two sources. But they just walked. They just walked and walked and walked after leaving this woods. And when they were eventually found, they were five miles away just on some random high street. They were just in public, in broad daylight. And they had blood on their clothes still because they hadn't gone anywhere. They hadn't got changed. They hadn't washed. They had blood all over their clothes. And when they were found, police found that backpack with the blood-soaked knife still inside it. So both of these girls were arrested and taken straight to the police station where they immediately confessed. I think they were scared. After all, these are two 12-year-old girls. I know I was scared of police when I was younger. I think they just, they, they didn't want to try and lie. That wasn't even an option for them. They just told the truth, like word vomit. Yeah, they told police that they had tried to kill their friend Peyton Lutner. And so police asked why, and these girls told them that it was a sacrifice to Slenderman. So they told police all about Slenderman, because of course police don't, <laughs> police don't know what's going on. So they said, tell me about this Slenderman and these rules and what, what you were doing for him. They told police all about how Slenderman has these servants, which are other young kids, they're called proxies, and he gets them to go out and murder for him. And Anissa told the police that one day Morgan had turned to her and said, you know what, we should be proxies. And so Anissa was like, okay, how do we do that? And according to Anissa, Morgan turned to her and said, we need to kill Peyton. It's the only way that we can prove ourselves to Slenderman. It's part of the Slenderman law that once a child sacrifices another child to Slenderman, once these proxies kill another kid, they get to then go and live with him in the woods in this big mansion that he supposedly has in the middle of the woods. But there was another element to it, which I think is probably the strongest element. And that was that if you become a proxy and if you commit a sacrifice for Slenderman, then he will spare you. He won't kill you if you kill for him. There was a big fear factor to it. They wanted to be on Slenderman's safe side because remember, these girls genuinely, genuinely believed in this. They believed that Slenderman could kill them and all of their families in a matter of seconds. And they felt that the only way to protect themselves and everyone that they loved was to kill someone else, was to appease Slenderman by sacrificing their best friend. So the girls told police absolutely everything about their whole plan, the whole attack, like they held absolutely nothing back. And they said that this actually wasn't their first attempt at killing Peyton. They tried a couple of times and it just kept going wrong. It had been planned long in advance that the two of them were, were gonna act on Morgan's birthday. That was Peyton's murder date set in their brains for, for a while before it happened. So that was the reason that Morgan wanted to go straight to sleep when they all got back to her house because their plan was to wait until Peyton was asleep and then ambush her in the middle of the night, put tape over her mouth so she can't scream for help, and then they were gonna slash her throat. But once Peyton fell asleep, the other two girls stayed up and they were gonna go ahead with the plan, but then they got cold feet. And I don't know for what reason exactly. I think they just realized that they couldn't do this in the house. There was no way that they were gonna be able to get away with this if they killed her in the house. There would be so much blood. They'd have to try and get rid of the body. There was just no way that they could do it there. And so that's when they made the plan to wake up the next morning and go to the park so they could kill her there, leave the body there and just, just leave that whole thing behind and run away. So when they left for the park the following morning, Morgan and Anissa had packed a kitchen knife inside a backpack. Their plan was 
was to kill Peyton in the public bathrooms of the park. They were gonna go there pretty much as soon as they got to the park. And the plan was that they were gonna try and knock her out, like hit her, knock her out, make her unconscious, and then drag her into one of the toilet stalls and stab her and kill her in there and then just leave her there and, and run off. But this didn't go to plan. They tried to go ahead with this plan. One of the girls, I believe, even hit Peyton to try and knock her out, but it didn't work. So they, they just hit her for no reason. And that was when girls told police about their plan B, which was the hide and seek game where they managed to get Peyton to voluntarily lay down and cover her eyes, essentially. She couldn't see anything. So she was then just an easy target for them. I actually have a quote from one of Anissa's interviews, which is quite horrifying. She was talking about how they were gonna send Peyton off to go and hide. And then she and Morgan were gonna be like lionesses chasing down a zebra. The two of them pounced on her, pinned her down. Morgan got out that knife to go and stab her. And then at this point, I think the two girls started arguing about who was gonna stab her. Morgan was very into it one minute and not the next. She was getting cold feet a lot throughout this process. And so she got this knife out and all of a sudden she didn't wanna do it. She turned to Anissa, handed her the knife and just said, I can't do it, you do it. You know where all the soft spots are. And so Anissa handed it back to her and said, no, you do it, just go ballistic. And so she did. Morgan turned around and stabbed her best friend, Peyton Lutner 19 times all over her body a 12 year old girl. In their police interviews, time and time again, Morgan and Anissa told police that they didn't want to kill Peyton. They didn't want to go through with that sacrifice, but they felt like they had to. They had to or Slenderman was gonna come for them. They thought that he was already stalking them, already watching them and waiting for them to do this. And they thought that if they didn't do this, then he was gonna get them. They thought that it was just a matter of time until he hurt them or their families. And so they needed to go ahead and sacrifice someone quick. And so police were saying, well, did you not realize what would happen if you killed your best friend, if you committed murder? And these girls said that they were much more scared of what would happen if they didn't kill Peyton and Slenderman came for them than if they did kill Peyton and then just went to prison. They would rather go to prison than get kidnapped and killed by Slender Man, who doesn't even exist. None of that even exists. So through all of these girls' interviews, police concluded that the main brains behind this attack was Morgan Geyser. And Anissa Weir was just a bit of a follower. She just said yes and was compliant with anything and everything Morgan wanted. They actually said that they highly doubt that Anissa Weir would have gone on to do anything like this had she never met Morgan. Morgan was the driving force, the, the persuasiveness behind getting her involved in this. Had she never met Morgan, she would have never committed an attack. And Morgan Geyser, by the way, in her police interviews, she was acting so weird. Like, not necessarily in the things that she was saying, but okay, for example, she was left alone in one of the interview rooms at one point and she gets up and starts dancing. She physically stands up and she starts doing like some weird like little tap dance or something. You are in a police interview being accused of the, m of the attempted murder of your best friend. Why are you dancing? What are you doing a tap dance for? But it was the things that Morgan was saying in her interviews these are so chilling. I've got a couple of quotes and they are some of the most chilling things I've ever heard from a true crime case. And I wanna remind you before I read these out that she is 12 years old and she has just tried to kill her best friend, right? She said to the police, it was weird. I felt no remorse. I thought I would. And when one of the officers asked her if she felt bad for stabbing Peyton, she responded, I thought about it, but then I decided that remorse would get me nowhere. It's easier to live without regrets. Which is crazy. What do you mean? I thought about being remorseful about trying to kill my friend, but then I decided not to be. So police, as part of this investigation, getting evidence against these girls, they decided to seize their home computers. And on Anissa's, they didn't really find anything because like I said, they think the brains behind all of this was Morgan and Morgan's computer search history was very telling. Apparently there were a few suspicious searches, but I only have one specific one right here and this is so on the nose. Morgan Geyser had Googled how to get away with murdering someone. Oh, come on. They also found a sketchbook in her locker at school that was full, 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 full of drawings of Slender Man, like violent drawings of him as well, like depicting him actually killing children this 12 year old girl is, is drawing this creature murdering kids. Anyway, 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 that was all the evidence that they managed to find against these two girls. Not that they really needed it because they had confessions, but anyway. So now it came to take this case to trial and both of these 12 year old girls were actually gonna be tried as adults, which, uh, ugh, why? 
Like, like, look, I'm not trying to defend these girls' actions in any way at all. Let me make that clear as day. What they did is horrific. But don't we have rules for a reason? Like, we try kids as kids for a reason, and that's because they're kids, because they're 12 years old. I just think, kind of especially in the case of Anissa, where police even agreed that she was a follower, she was just doing everything that Morgan said, and she would have never acted like this had she never met Morgan. I don't know, something about her being charged, like, tried as an adult doesn't feel entirely right and I feel kind of weird saying that. And actually when you find out that both of these girls as part of their you know court trial whatever they were both given psychiatric assessments and they were both found to be mentally ill. They were both diagnosed with different mental illnesses. Morgan Geyser was diagnosed with schizophrenia and it turned out that she actually had been seeing Slenderman this whole time. That was the majority of her solution. Her hallucinations and delusions. I just tried to mash them together. The majority of her hallucinations was her seeing Slender Man. No wonder she believed all of this because it, it, it was there in front of her eyes. Why would she not believe it? So of course she thought that he was a real danger to her and her family. And again, none of this is in defense of what she did. I think what she did is horrific. But all of that taken into consideration, they were both 12 years old, both mentally ill, why are they being tried as adults? I just don't understand it. Logically, it doesn't make much sense to me because we have these rules for a reason and I feel like why... I don't get it, I don't get it, and I'm gonna move on. <laughs> the two of them both decided to plead guilty to their individual charges. Of course, they were very compliant all the way through this case. They confessed to everything, both pled guilty. Anissa Weir was sentenced to 25 years to life in a psychiatric unit, and Morgan Geyser was sentenced to 40 years to life in a psychiatric unit. After the attack, Peyton Lutner, of course, suffered horrifically with both physical and mental issues following this attack. She would have breakdowns, nightmares. A lot of the time she would have to sleep in her mother's bed with her because she couldn't be alone. She was always paranoid. She couldn't trust anyone. She struggled to make friends and do social things. She even, for years after this, she slept with scissors under her pillow every single night because she was so scared. And one of the most horrific things to come out of this case was actually copycat killings after it. People hearing about this case and thinking, oh, I'm gonna sacrifice someone to Slenderman now. This has happened a few times. I don't know exactly how many there's been, but I have two specific ones to talk about. The first one actually happened only a few days after Peyton's case hit the news. It was a 13 year old girl who turned around and stabbed her own mother in an attempt to sacrifice her to Slenderman. And then a few months after that, there was a 14 year old girl in Florida that set her own house on fire with her mother and her brother inside it Again, trying to sacrifice them to Slenderman. All of these people survived, by the way. All, all four of the victims of these Slenderman attacks have survived. In March of 2021, Anissa Weir appeared in court once again. At this point, she'd been in a psychiatric unit for like four years, nearly four years. And it was determined that she was no longer suffering with her mental illness. She'd made a lot of progress. She seemed like an entirely different girl to the one that had been sent to the psychiatric unit. And so the decision was made to release Anissa Weir. She served three years and 10 months in the psychiatric unit in total and Morgan Geyser is still in the hospital to this day. But that is all I have on this case. Thank you so, so much for watching and thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. If you go to nordvpn.com forward slash Eleanor, there will be an exclusive deal waiting for you there and it is completely risk-free with NordVPN's 30 day money back guarantee. You can also go through the link down below in the description of this video. A huge thank you to all of my channel members for supporting the channel and helping me decide the cases that I cover. All of my tier two members are on screen right now. So thank you so much. If you want to become a channel member you can click the join button down below but yeah thank you so so much for watching if you enjoyed please leave a thumbs up down below that would really help me out if you want to subscribe there'll be a circle that you can click and, and that'll do it for you and if you want to watch another vid there you go there you go have that one uh bye